first book, the title Kinematics of Vitamin D3 in the Osteoblastic Cell. Good afternoon, Dr. Lee, Mike. Like you said, um, my presentation is on kinematics of the vitamin D3 in the osteoblastic cell. A uh, quick overview of the presentation. I'll start off by going through the introduction to the basic biological processes involved, and then I'll go through what our goals were and where we started, and finally our model and our conclusions. So a basic description of the biology. Vitamin D3 is created in the skin or is absorbed through, uh, through body, through, in your body through the food that you eat. And it enters the body in the form of D3. Uh, it must be converted into 25D, which is just adding a hydroxyl group, and this happens in the liver. And then in order to be used by the body, it has to be in the form 125D, which is an addition to another hydroxyl group. And this can happen in the kidneys or in the case that we're interested in in the osteoblastic cells. And the osteoblastic cell is just basically the bone cell. It's what creates bone cells. So, talking about vitamin D in bone cells. Uh, in order to get is absorbed into the cells, uh, the 25D that's in the bloodstream, or the serum, yeah, it must bind to a D-binding protein, which is just a molecule that facilitates this absorption into the cell. And this is the, the, D, the D, DP 25D complex, the complex that actually interacts with the cell, with the surface of the cell and the interior of the cell. And this is a basic diagram of how these, the process of absorption works. Up top, up here, is the bloodstream. Uh, the big pink circles are the D binding protein, and the little green squares are the vitamin D25. Uh, as you can see, there is much more D binding protein than there is 25D. Uh, so all of the 25D in the, blood, in the bloodstream is bonded to D binding protein. And the way it interacts with the cell, there are two main areas of the cell we're concerned with. This is called the buffer region, which we take from Petrucini, who came up with the initial model for uh, cell absorption, and then the coated pits region. And there are receptors in both areas, and the D-binding protein can interact with receptors in both areas. So once it interacts with receptors in the buffer area, those buffers will turn into a, into a coated pit, and then the coated pits become invaginated into the cell into what's called a coated vesicle. And then it goes through various steps, various endosomes, as it gets moved through the cell. This is Rattushini's, uh, this is Rattushini's model. So he has a number of, of extra endosomes going through, and he describes that as saying that he needed his extra endosomes to make a timeline for his model and fit the data that was available. Uh, so his, his uh, Rattushini's model was for low-density lipoprotein, which has a similar absorption process to 25D, so we felt comfortable using this model and adapting it to our process. Uh, one thing that we wanted to improve on was that his model did not have a spatial aspect. It was purely kinematic, purely time, and just the time it took to move through various stages in the cell. So we wanted to model movement through the cell as well as the time it takes for the different uh, metabolism, metabolism processes that take place. Uh, so we will use a spatial model to determine which particular uh, parameters have the largest effect on the time it takes for absorption through the cell and metabolism from 25D into 125D. Uh, so we modeled our, our uh, model after Rotation. He uses mass action equations, which I'll explain in, in a moment. And we developed a set of equations similar to his, but slightly different to fit our model better. And our model has a total of 19 mass action equations. Uh, just, to, just to give you an idea of where they come from, these are the first four. So X1, as you can see on this, is unbinded D-binding protein. So it's D-binding protein in the serum that does not have a 25D molecule binding to it. And it goes, we have a uh, proportionality constant, and then we show we say that the amount of, of free D binding protein in the serum decreases proportionally to uh, the, the amount of D binding protein and the empty buffer receptors on, this, on, the, on the on the buffer right here, which is these empty receptors right here. And it also decreases proportionally to the product of yeah, the free D binding protein in the serum and the empty uh, receptors in the coated pits, which are over here. And then. We say it increases proportionally to 
this constant, which represents the constant the, uh, rate at which uh, protectors that have already captured a D-binding protein release them back into the serum. So the amount of D-binding protein in the serum goes up proportionally to the amount of uh, occupied receptors on, in the buffer as well as in the coded pits. And you can see how this, this process works through each one. So for example, if we want to look at uh, X3, which is the amount of, un, amount of empty receptors in the, in the buffer region, you see that it goes down with respect to the amount of free uh, DVP in the serum as well as the binded DVP in the serum and uh, times the concentration of already empty buffer receptors and increases with the same rate, the same rate constants above where it's, uh, it's occupied receptors releasing the D binding protein that they have. And this is the process over here where the, uh, the, the receptors on the buffer will, will transform into coded pits before imagination. So, so even if X1 equals zero, it doesn't stay zero if you've got some X5 right. and X8. Right, exactly. So these are, so we, when we, we started off our initial conditions, we started off with, with just these out here and it's some empty buffers. We do not have anything already in the system and it, as the, uh, because these are, because these are time derivatives, uh, even if the initial condition is zero, eventually they will grow. So that was the basic mentality with how we developed our system of equations. And we did it through all of this, all of these different steps. Um, and through this, we were able to test Petrucci's model and determine if our model produced similar results, but we didn't use the exact same equations, and we found that it did produce similar results. And the reason that we determined we used this is we want to use a truncated version of this to model the uh, absorption across the cell wall, across the cell surface, and then use that as our initial condition for uh, for the, the spatial model that we use. So we truncate it here. Once we turn, once we get rid of the uh, the receptors that travel back to the surface, and we just have the DVP and the 25D. That's our initial condition for our spatial model. And like I said before, Petrucci adds extra steps just to slow down. The, his model to make it better match the uh, experimental results. So as you can see, it creates about a 10 minute delay between the no extra steps and the extra steps. And we were able to determine this uh, and get the same, the same results that he did with our model. And then this is the uh, development of molecules in the, in the step what we're going to use as an initial condition. So you can see how it builds up over the course of an hour, starting from zero. And like I said before, we'll use this as our initial condition for our spatial model. Um, so that, like I said, was is just as it crosses the surface of the cell until it gets inside the cell. And then from the cell surface to the mitochondria, we're using a diffusion affection equation to model movement along the cytoskeletal tracts. So inside, this, inside the cell, all transport is uh, along these, along basically these tracts that use motor proteins that latch on to, in this case, D binding protein to FD and essentially pull it along the tracks to the center of the cell. Once we reach the mitochondria, we will use a pure diffusion equation, a pure uh, diffusion equation to represent entering the mitochondria. And then once we're inside, we will use a michaelis minton mass action equation to uh, model the metabolism from 25D to 125D. Timothy Elston came up with a model of cytoskeletal uh, tract movements. He uses this diffusion infection equation. Like I said before, the motor proteins will latch on to the, in this case, 25D, and pull it along, uh, pull it along the cytoskeletal tracks. So in order to, to use this equation, we had to solve for these two coefficients, which is which we uh, which we will do in a second. This is a model of how the motor protein actually moves along the cytoskeletal track. So it begins here, and the DVP will be attached up here, and then uh, different ATP, ADP processes will let this either detach here, rotate, uh, and then retach down here, or through a different path, rotate in a similar fashion. And this is modeled after a, uh, a paper by Shastri. And all of these coefficients were given by Shastri in his paper, except for this K rebind right here. There's experimental evidence that says that uh, as, as these motor proteins are moving along the cytoskeletal, cytoskeletal tracks, 
they uh, periodically disconnect from the, the tracks. So they're not constantly being pulled through. And we know the rate constant for that, but we don't know the rate constant for how they reattach to the cytoskeletal tracks once they disconnect. So that was one of the parameters that we wanted to test to see what kind of effect that would have on our system, changing that parameter around. Uh, so we, uh, Shashri in his paper uses a Markov process uh, to determine where the, the probability of uh, motor proteins being in certain places along the track. This is the equation that he uses. Uh, L will be the transition matrix between each position. So the positions are 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and 6 and 7. So we had a 6x6 uh, six six matrix because once it gets to here, it moves back. This is the same position as here. So we had a 6x6 six six transition matrix. And then rho, in this case, is the, the uh, probability matrix of um, the location of the motor protein along the scale of track. Uh, Elston shows that the probability vectors form a Gaussian distribution for uh, the position along the Scottsdale track, and he provides a way to calculate the two coefficients we're interested in from our transition matrix, which consists of the which consists of these k's right here. Like I said before, we want to use uh, k rebind to the rate at which it attaches back to the to the, to the south scale track as one of our parameters to determine how it affects our system. And we were able to, using Elson's method, come up with uh, uh, the different ways that carry by affects, in this case, the uh, diffusion constants as well as the velocity coefficient. So you can tell that as carry by gets very large, the diffusion coefficient uh, goes as positive as zero, and as it gets very large, the velocity constant goes up. So we use these two, uh, these two equations that we determined to come up with three different scenarios where we have uh, we picked a carry bind of 10 per seconds, 0.05 per seconds, and 0 0.005 per seconds, and then we found the corresponding coefficients for each each k, and then we use that in our uh, in our diffusion convection equation to model the movement along the scale tracks. And then, as I said before, we used the, the kinetic model to come up with our initial conditions. And then to cross the, uh, the membrane of the mitochondria, we used a pure uh, diffusion equation. And we said that flux and concentration were continuous across the membrane of the mitochondria. Um, so, and then once we get into the mitochondria, we use this condition to represent no more flow out of the mitochondria. So once it reaches the mitochondria, it gets metabolized, but doesn't, it doesn't leave as 25B. And then this is the uh, this is the movement across along the cell skeletal tract. So this is at the center of the mitochondria, at the center of the cell before it enters the mitochondria, or after it enters the mitochondria. Excuse me. And you can tell that from this graph that there is relatively little effect between dropping carry bind from 10 per second to 0 0.05 per second, but a further decrease of one order of magnitude greatly delays the rate at which the motor proteins pull the DVP along the side of the tracks. So this is an interest to us as to uh, why that was the case. And then once you get into the mitochondria, we have to uh, metabolize the, one, the D25D into 125D. And to do this, we used McKellar's minimum mass action equations. So this is the same sort of idea as the beginning mass action equations, where we have uh, the rate at which uh, this particular, this in this case, this is the enzyme that is used for metabolism. The rate at which that builds up is proportional to uh, the amount of different things in, this, in the mitochondria. So in this case, E is the amount of enzyme that is used by this metabolism process. S is the amount of 25D that's waiting to be metabolized. ES is the complex of enzyme and DVP, so once the DVP bonds to the enzyme, uh, that's what this represents. And then P is after the enzyme and the 25D have disassociated, and the 25D has turned into 125D. So this is what we were interested in. This is what our final product was. And like I said before, this is a fairly standard model of uh, metabolism in, uh, in cells. Uh, we use the time derivative of the total of 25D as our source term. So we have our source right here. 
and we use the time derivative because we're talking about time derivative over here. So we use the time derivative of this, e of this equation as our source for metabolism. And those look like this. So as you can tell, there's still a big difference uh, initially. And after about a period of an hour, they all go, they all reach about the same, about the same steady state. And this was our result from the conversion uh, in, in the mitochondria. And we determined that there was also about a 10 minute delay between uh, these two and the much lower K-rebind. So we found that changing K-rebind was a way to add a significant delay to the movement along the skeletal tracks. And also that that delay was fairly similar to the delay that uh, Rattushini uh, induced when he added the, the extra steps to his process. So that, that could be one, one of the things that caused uh, the delay that Rattushini had to change his system to adapt to. And relatively little is known about what the actual value of K-rebind is. Uh, there's not been very much research done on to that uh, particular uh, parameter. So this would be a good candidate for further research. And then the sources that I had. Any questions?